Hello and welcome. I'm Peter Afrasiabi, host of The Curious Lawyer, and today's program is looking at the Vietnam War. We are going to look at free speech, the protests, conscientious objectors, and the legality of the war ultimately. Did courts ever even pass on the constitutionality of it? Was it even challenged? What happened? That's our program today and that's where we're going. But first, I want to pause and talk to you briefly about The Curious Lawyer, the actual programs and the purpose of it. The Curious Lawyer lets us take interesting, fascinating issues and intersect them with the law so that we can see what the output is and get new experiences to walk down different paths that we may not go down in our day-to-day -day practice and really open our eyes and broaden our horizons, so to speak, on a variety of different issues. The result of that is that we've looked at programs such as the CIA law program, the dog law program, celebrity and paparazzi law. These types of programs let us understand where the CIA, for example, intersects with our different legal regimes. It lets us explore some First Amendment issues, Freedom of Information Act issues, and of course you get to find out where the famous saying, I can neither confirm nor deny, comes from. We have the Bill of Rights series where for one hour you'll be on the First Amendment, hour two on the Second Amendment, and so forth, so that in 10 hours you'll know everything there is to know about the Bill of Rights. And then of course there's a program on, for example, Yellowstone. Is there a tiny sliver of Yellowstone National Park where you can get away with murder? I'm not going to answer the question, you got to go watch the program to find out, but I'll tell you right now, please don't go commit a murder at Yellowstone National Park. Well, today's program then lets us take a look at the Vietnam War, the, an obviously contentious war in the 1960s and early 1970s um, in American society, and we get to analyze and assess what was the intersection of the Vietnam War with the American legal regime, and what is the legal landscape that came out of the law colliding with the Vietnam War for us as lawyers, both at the time, but obviously to this day, because the legacy of so much um, constitutional jurisprudence that came out of Vietnam War collisions in society is with us to this day and casts a long, long shadow. The result is that we will look, as you see on our slide here on our agenda, at the overall landscape. We will look at the First Amendment significantly. And so there's a few categories of First Amendment issues we're going to consider. The first, of course, are the First Amendment free speech cases, where we will look at draft card burning, armbands, and vulgar language, all of which triggered a variety of significant um, First Amendment cases, which to this day are massively important. We will also look at some of the religion aspects and the, the religion clauses of the First Amendment, and that is going to take us to the First Amendment um, conscientious objector doctrine, and specifically, we're going to look at when the famed heavyweight champion of the world, Muhammad Ali, refused to fight. We will also look under our First Amendment segment at some freedom of press cases. And of course, that brings us to the Pentagon Papers, when there was a massive brouhaha in society as the New York Times and the Washington Post were set to release that generation's secret papers, which had been secretly delivered to the press, not unlike um, WikiLeaks today with the internet, we have different leaks going on of a different kind, but a lot, a lot of those similar issues were triggered at the time, leading, of course, to the famous Pentagon Papers cases and the issue of um, the judicial issuance of prior restraints. We will ask and look at the shadow that's cast to this day in the 21st century, um, you know, in the mid-2020s now, and we'll be looking at a lot of the recent student protest cases that have happened and just considering student protests and student campus codes, speech codes, all of which harken back to these seminal decisions which we live with today. And we will end asking the question about the legality of the war. And we'll look at some actual 1960s and 70s litigation over that question that ultimately the Supreme Court ducked, but which did find its way in front of lower federal courts. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. You see here on our slide, that is the First Amendment, the seminal language that's so important to us. This requires us to then look at, from these different clauses that come out of the First Amendment, 
the free speech protections, the free press protections, free religion protections, and free assembly provisions. All of which are triggered in our jurisprudence we'll look at and all of which collided with the Vietnam War, ultimately, in terms of social um, protests and discourse that occurred as a result of the war, which funneled its way into the free speech, free press, free religion, and free assembly to engage in speech um, cases. Now, this has been applied to the states by the 14th Amendment's incorporation doctrine. So you'll remember from your Bill of Rights series, I know you've watched that the Bill of Rights to the Constitution applied originally to the federal government and by way of adoption of the 14th Amendment um, after the Civil War, we've had almost the entirety of the Bill of Rights incorporated um, through the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment and made applicable to the states so that the limitations on um, government laws respecting the establishment of religion, for example, don't apply only to Congress, um, the federal government, they apply also to state governments um, by way of the incorporation doctrine. And that has, the incorporation doctrine has incorporated all of the First Amendment and made it fully applicable as a limitation on state governmental behavior also. Now we're going to start with a modern test for incitement as a form, as a lower protected speech category. And we need to sort of frame what we're talking about here with the Vietnam War cases we're going to look at by really starting with an area of speech that can be prescribed by the government because it's less protected, and that is incitement speech. And this, of course, brings us to a case, Brandenburg versus Ohio, 395 U.S. 444. The case was from 1969, although it was not a case that came out of um, the Vietnam War collisions of the time. It came out of um, racial strife, um, social tensions going on at the time. But it's a significant case for us to look at because it will cast a shadow for how other speech is handled and addressed as we move forward through our Vietnam War Curious Lawyer program. So let's take a look at Brandenburg on our slide here. And the basic fact pattern is, um, fact pattern is that Brandenburg um, was a guy who was addressing a gathering of KKK members in Ohio. Now during his speech, um, which had been recorded by the media who had been invited to attend, he discussed the fate of the, quote, white Caucasian race, end quote, at the hands of government. He made a variety of anti-Semitic and anti-black statements, and he alluded to the possibility of revengeance, which appears to be some sort of amalgam of the word um, vengeance and revenge that he had put together. If the federal government and the court continued to, quote, suppress the white Caucasian race, end quote. And so those are his statements. He also announced that his fellow Klan members were going to march in Washington, D.C. on Independence Day. For his speech, he was arrested and he was convicted of advocating criminal activity um, or unlawful methods of terrorism in political reform. And so those were the charges that were brought against Brandenburg by the state of Ohio. Um, now, this case made its way up um, to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court unanimously reversed his Ohio conviction. And in so doing, they abandoned the long-standing sort of Abrams, Frank, Debs, clear and present danger test. You all remember that from the First Amendment Bill of Rights series you did or from law school, but coming out of World War I and the, the great social schisms of that time, the Supreme Court had created a clear and present danger test um, such that if the speech posed a clear and present danger, then it could be prescribed. In any event, it's now in 1969 that that test was reversed. And instead, the Supreme Court in Brandenburg adopted a two-pronged test to evaluate speech. Um, the first being, speech can be prohibited if it is directed at inciting or producing imminent lawless action. And number two, it is likely to incite or produce such action. So that is the test, this imminent lawless action, incitement to imminent lawless behavior test that Brandenburg adopted and which we live with to this day in the 21st century. And so this is important for us to now frame that category of prescribable speech so we can start understanding if some of the speech we're seeing is incitement speech, subject to being prescribed, or free speech, subject to um, being spoken and said notwithstanding the great offense that the speech may cause, as Mr. Brandenburg's speech obviously did.
So we're gonna start with United States versus O'Brien, 391 US 367. It's a 1968 case. And this, as you see here, picture of um, draft card being burned is the case um, of burning a draft card as an act of symbolic speech against the Vietnam War. And so you see there this photo we have of um, Mr. O'Brien burning his draft card. And it's a significant form of social protest that was used in the 1960s because the war was unpopular. Obviously, the draft was drafting a variety of young, um, young, young men off to war. And so as an act of social defiance and protest, people were burning their draft cards, um, which had been issued to them to show up for the draft to be you know, you know, conscribed and put into the war. So let's take a look at the facts on our slide here. And so basically, we have the situation of O'Brien and some of his friends. They burned their selective um, service registration certificate cards, um, draft cards as they're known, before a crowd on the steps of a Boston courthouse. And so as they burned these um, registration certificate cards, there were a variety of FBI agents who were in the crowd. And they witnessed this and watched it. Um, and they actually then saw that O'Brien and his friends were ultimately attacked by um, people in the crowd who were you know, opposed to their um, burning of the draft cards as an act of protest. And so the FBI agents then intervened. They got O'Brien to safety in the courthouse from the crowd that was attacking him. And upon getting him to, you know, safely into the courthouse so he was not going to be pummeled, they gave him his Miranda warning, basically, as he gave him notice of a right to counsel and the right to remain silent. Now, O'Brien volunteered that he absolutely knew he was violating federal law by burning his draft card, but he did so because of his beliefs. And he showed the FBI agents these remains of his draft card. There were some like, charred pieces of paper and whatnot. And as you see here, he did it, quote, so that other people would reevaluate their positions with selective service, with the armed forces, and reevaluate their place in the culture of today to hopefully consider my position, end quote. That's what he tells them. So the result is that he gets indicted, tried, and convicted for violating a federal statute. Um, it was part of the, U the Universal Military Training and Service Act. Um, and this applies to any person, quote, um, who forges, alters, knowingly destroys, knowingly mutilates, or in any manner changes any such certificate. So it made it a um, criminal offense to do that, and he therefore knowingly altered, destroyed, mutilated, and damaged or changed his certificate by burning it. So those are our basic facts, and we're gonna look at what happens as this case works its way up to the Supreme Court. And so you see here on our next slide, we've got the Sixth Circuit held this federal law unconstitutional in part, but it ultimately affirmed his conviction under another provision of the statute. So it basically left this opinion now published that the law lacked any validity whatsoever. Um, and so the government appealed and the Supreme Court took the case. Now, before the Supreme Court, O'Brien argued the law was unconstitutional as applied to him because his act of burning his registration certificate was protected symbolic speech. And his argument was that this symbolic speech, even if it's not words I utter, but it's symbolic speech of burning a draft card, is my freedom of expression speech within the First Amendment. And his argument was that um, the, these First Amendment freedom of expression um, guarantees include all modes of communication of ideas, including by conduct, and that his conduct was within this definition because he did it in demonstration against the Vietnam War and against the draft. So let's take a listen here to a few minutes of the oral argument that we have thankfully recorded, and you can hear an important part of it here for us to understand our presentation today. Um, of, of the Supreme Court arguments. Go ahead and listen. Well, I suppose, I suppose somebody who had the very sincere uh, belief that the laws against robbery were all wrong could not go express that belief by going around and robbing houses because that would be uh, injuring other people. Uh, but here you don't have any of that quality, do you? We don't have present that day. quality, but we do maintain that there was a valid reason for the enactment of this statute, not aesthetics to be sure, but one related to the uh, effective operation of the selective service system, which is within the 
power expressly granted to Congress to raise and support armies and to enact all laws necessary and proper to uh, carry out the uh, foregoing powers. Uh, Let me see if I can help to answer your question by turning to uh, another uh, one which is uh, uh, more emotional, uh, the flag. Uh, neither side here has made much reference to the flag. I suppose because it comes close to the line. Of course, the flag is a symbol, and burning or defiling a flag could be regarded as symbolic speech. As things have developed in this country, Legislation with respect to desecration of the flag has been almost entirely left to the states. Nearly every state has such a statute. The only act of Congress relates to the District of Columbia. It is applicable to anyone who shall publicly mutilate, same word as we have here, deface, defile, or defy, trample upon, or cast contempt either by word or action, upon any such flag. That's Title IV of the United States Code, uh, Section 3. Can there be any doubt about the validity of such a statute? I would have thought not, and similar legislation has been applied in many state decisions. Of course, a draft card is not a flag. Nevertheless, it can be regarded as a symbol of public authority. I suppose that the fact that it is such a symbol is what makes it attractive to burn it. So there you had a few minutes of oral argument, and you had the government lawyer um, arguing an absolute right to regulate the burning of um, these flags, as an example, um, even though it would be a very symbolic act. And so I give that to you is an important part to understand at this time the government's arguments. We're talking about flag burning in a second too. But the government said the government fully can criminalize the destruction of draft cards the same way it can regulate the burning of flags. All of them are symbolic acts and all can be prescribed speech. So what did the Supreme Court do? Well, it held, as you see on our slide here, in a seven to one decision, quote, We cannot accept the view that an apparently limitless variety of conduct can be labeled speech whenever the person engaging in the conduct intends thereby to express an idea. However, even on the assumption that the alleged communicative element in O'Brien's conduct is sufficient to bring into play the First Amendment, it does not necessarily follow that the destruction of a registration certificate is constitutionally protected activity. Courts held that when speech and non-speech elements are combined in the same course of conduct, a sufficiently important governmental interest in regulating the non-speech element can justify incidental limitation on First Amendment freedom. So basically, they looked at this concept of taking the transactional facts that may include verbal and non-verbal, and if there's non-verbal, then the limit of the non-verbal can be okay if it falls into the verbal area, which would otherwise be protected, right? And so what the court ultimately held is that the anti-burning law, we can call it, right, this, this sort of law banning the right to burn a draft card, was, was a government regulation that was sufficiently justified by the government um, in terms of prescribing it, even if it was symbolic speech of some kind, because it furthered an important or substantial government interest, the court held. And here, the government had an interest in suppressing this kind of conduct that may bleed into speech that was unrelated, the government argued, to any act of suppressing free expression. Instead, it was an incidental restriction, perhaps, on these First Amendment freedoms the court held, Um, but it was no greater than necessary to further the government's interest. And the basic government interest here at play, as the court noted, was that Congress has got the power to make and raise armies, to create a registration system for people to participate then in wars when the Congress wants us to go off to war, And cooperation in it is a legitimate part of this conscription system. And so if you have documents relevant to allowing proof that are needed to show that you're in compliance, you're not in compliance, who you are and what like, um, the documents had notices on them too that were relevant for the possessor in terms of addressing uh, 
um, giving address changes and the like. And so within this conscription system that Congress had the right to create, it had the right to insist you preserve that document. And so as a result, um, O'Brien's act of burning his draft card was held to be an act that was not one of free expression. But we had one dissenter I noted. So let's take a look at what, Ju what Justice Douglas um, dissented and said. The court states the constitutional power of Congress to raise and support armies is broad and sweeping. Congress's power to classify and conscript men, power for military service is beyond question. This is true in times when by declaration of Congress, the nation is in a state of war. The underlying basic problem in this case, however, is whether conscription is permissible in the absence of a declaration of war. So this is a very important dissent that I flagged for you because we're gonna get on the back end of this program to the question of, is the war legal? And Just Justice Douglas was one of the justices on the Supreme Court sort of pounding the table ultimately saying, um, we need to address that question. Con Congress has never declared war um, in Vietnam. And so therefore, if we don't have a true state of war, Maybe someone's got the right to burn a draft card. That's the way it funneled up in this case. But in any event, it was a dissent. I leave that for you. Let's take a pit stop here on flag burning because you saw the O'Brien oral argument I gave you in terms of the government lawyer saying that, of course, you can prescribe and delimit the right to burn a flag the same way you can a draft card. And the court in O'Brien, of course, said, yeah, the government can restrict the, uh, the right to burn a draft card. So you may have been left scratching your head saying, wait a second, I thought flag burning was legal. Texas v. Johnson, it is. Um, and so here we have the case, of course, the famous case where, you know, um, Johnson burns a flag outside the 1984 Republican National Convention in Dallas. He did it to protest President Reagan's policies. He gets arrested and convicted under a Texas law that um, made it illegal to burn a flag. So let's take a listen to the oral argument section here because I just want you to hear this part because it's important because it loops back to O'Brien. So listen to this. So the conviction rests basically upon his wearing it in the courtroom of the uh, in the uh, corridor of the building. Precisely, Mr. Justice Stewart, yes. In, in this respect, it's no different, is it, from what it would be if he'd been picked up out on the street in front of the building or in any other public place? Exactly, so Mr. The, Chief Justice. I think that's the precisely... The courthouse atmosphere has nothing to do with it. I think it has. it is not an issue in this case. Yes, Your Honor. Well, wouldn't you think that there's some things people couldn't do in the courtroom that they could do in other places? Mr. Justice Black, I would think there are some things that in the courtroom itself, while court is in, in session, uh, would be improper, consistent uh, with the First Amendment. Uh, I don't he, think that arises in this case. You said he did not wear this jacket in the courtroom. That is correct, Your Honor. And I was making the, the distinction, if hypothetically something had occurred in the courtroom while court was in session, it might be a different case. That That is well, not you, this case, Your well, Honor. Did it right at the front door of the courtroom while court was in session? Your Honor, as far as the record indicates... I'm not talking now about what your, what your merits of your case. Yes. But uh, do you not think that a court could have something to say more than they would if it was man was walking down the street? <coughs> Mr. Justice Black, I think that... Uh, when, we, when you get into the question of, of contempt, which that really uh, raises, uh, this court's standard that has been adopted uh, in, in numerous cases, namely that there must be a showing that the speech creates a clear and present danger of, of interference with the judicial process would apply. And conceivably, in given facts where those words do appear during session of the court, not merely in the physical courtroom, but while court is in session, Conceivably, uh, that would apply, but that is not this case, with all respect, Your Honor. <coughs> so that uh, this young man was arrested while walking in the corridor, and I think it is, it is vital to point out to the court... Uh, that which, there was, which courthouse in Los Angeles? It is in the Los Angeles County Courthouse, Mr. Justice Brennan. That's not the very large one, is it? Uh, it is, yes, it is a very large one. And that one, the 100 court, courtrooms? Is Something that? like that, Your Honor, yes. It incidentally is not a courtroom where draft cases are tried. It's not the federal court, it's the state court. So there you heard the oral argument on flag burning and you know, from the Supreme Court's perspective, um, what's going on? And ultimately as the court held five to four, the flag burning is an act of symbolic speech that someone has the right to do. And the government cannot just permit certain symbols to be used to communicate only certain messages. Um, and that enters ter territory ultimately 
that has no boundaries to it. And what's of note here, they actually addressed O'Brien and they noted that Texas hasn't asserted an interest in support of his conviction that's unrelated to the suppression of expression that would therefore permit application of the O'Brien test. So in other words, O'Brien had government um, interests in preserving the draft card and the like that served the, the selective service system and going to war and address changes and all that. Texas didn't have a comparable rationale, as, as you can understand, in terms of justifying flag burning. It was just, we don't want you to burn a flag. Um, so the result is that O'Brien is good law insofar as sort of the books say, because it was um, not just an offense um, at the symbolic speech at issue. Now, this brings us to our next case in the 1960s, Tinker versus Des Moines Independent Community School District, 393 U.S. 503, 1969. You see here on our slide, picture of um, the Tinkers, um, family of teenage students and their friends who were wearing black armbands to protest the Vietnam War. And there they are with their armbands, those black armbands with a peace sign on them. So our facts, let's get going. You got a, a bunch of adults and students in Des Moines, Iowa. They hold a meeting at, at the family home. Um, they're discussing the Vietnam War and they wanted to publicize their objections to what was going on and their demand for a truce by wearing black armbands during the holiday season and by fasting on December the 16th and New Year's Eve. So in any event, they go out and do that. And this is just their private thing they're doing. But the principal of the schools learn about this. And this is sort of elementary, junior, and high school. And so on December 14th, these principals and the school board folks get together and they adopt a policy that any student wearing an armband to school would be asked to remove it. And if they refused, they'd be suspended. So. The students show up to elementary, middle, and high school wearing the bands, asked to remove it, they refuse, they get suspended, parents file a civil rights lawsuit. The district court held that their suspension was okay because we're trying to prevent disturbances in the school. But what did the Supreme Court hold? Well, this brings us to the Supreme Court's opinion on the next slide here. You see pages 508 to 509 of the opinion. The Supreme Court held in our system, undifferentiated fear or apprehension of disturbance is not enough to overcome the right to freedom of expression. Any departure from absolute regimentation may cause trouble. Any variation from the majority's opinion may inspire fear. Any words spoken in class, in the lunchroom, on the campus that derives, that deviates from the views of another person may start an argument or cause a disturbance. But our constitution says we must take this risk. And our history says that it is this sort of hazardous freedom this kind of openness that is the basis of our nation's strength and of the independence and vigor of Americans who grow up and live in this relatively permissive, often disputatious society. And this is the quote that sort of um, has echoed through the decades since. It can hardly be argued that either students or teachers shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. So ultimately, what the Supreme Court held here is that if the speech was to be limited, this kind of student symbolic speech, it needed to show that it was caused by something more than a mere desire to avoid discomfort or unpleasantness. Um, we have to be exposed to things we don't like, and that's the nature of the First Amendment. And so ultimately, the prohibition could not be sustained. So where we stand, of course, is that the burning of the draft card could be limited, and you know one didn't necessarily have the right to burn a draft card within the First Amendment, but one has the right to um, wear an armband within the First Amendment. Go figure. Um, so Justice Black dissented. Justice Black, of course, felt that um, the act of wearing the armbands would cause confusion and irritation in, in the classroom, divert them from their thoughts about um, what they should be doing in school and the like, and so it should be able to um, be prescribed because it was causing problems in the classroom. This brings us to our next case. It's the famous case of Cohen v. California, 403 U.S. 15, 1971. And this is the F the draft case, fuck the draft case. And that's the phrase that's an important phrase. So, you know, obviously it's crude to say it, but that is the phrase that's at issue here. And this is the case of offensive speech and whether criminal punishment can flow. I, if you, as you've noticed on these cards, I've had photographs that are particularly relevant for us to understand what we're looking at. Like O'Brien, we had to understand what burning of draft card is and how that can be symbolic and what's going on. We have to understand armbands, like what is an armband and how does it work? Um, this case, of course, had that phrase put on a jacket. I don't have a picture of the jacket for you, 
I'm gonna tell you why in a second, but let's keep going. What happened? Well, Cohen wears the jacket that says, fuck the draft, stop the war. And that's printed on his jacket. Now he wears this into a California court um, and nothing happened in particular. There's no evidence that the jacket caused any kind of a violent reaction. People didn't come up to him and fight with him. He basically just walked into the court, went to the courtroom, he took off his jacket, put it on his lap. Um, and at some point though, he gets arrested um, under a California statute that forbids maliciously and willfully disturbing the peace or quiet of any neighborhood or person by offensive conduct. So court marshals basically um, see the jacket, see the words on it, and go out and arrest um, Mr. Cohen. And so the case makes its way up to the Supreme Court, and the ultimate issue is whether the state may punish someone um, with you know, criminal punishment for a message conveyed, even if it's profane. And you know, we can take for granted that F the draft is profane, but it's a message that perhaps has to be profane to make a point um, about the Vietnam War. So let's take a listen again here for a couple minutes to the Supreme Court oral argument, which is particularly fun and interesting to listen to. So check this out, then we'll talk about it briefly. Mr. Nimmer, you may proceed whenever you're ready. I might suggest to you that, as in most cases, the court's thoroughly familiar with the factual setting of this case and not be necessary for you, I'm sure, to dwell on the facts. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. This case is, of course, here upon appeal from a judgment of the Court of Appeals, State of California, upon this court's order postponing jurisdiction pending hearing, of the merit, uh, hearing uh, on the merits. The Chief Justice's suggestion, I certainly will keep very brief the, the statement of facts, uh, but Fundamentally, we do have here the appellant charged and convicted of engaging in tumultuous and offensive conduct in violation of the California Disturbing the Peace Statute, Penal Code Section 415. Although there was a reversal upon uh, a, the first level of appeal, appellate department of the Superior Court, it was then certified to the Court of Appeals, which vacated and affirmed the judgment. The California Supreme Court refused a hearing four to three decision on that. And of course, fundamentally, may it please the court, what this young man did was to walk through a courthouse corridor in Los Angeles County on his way to a courtroom where he had some business. Uh, uh, Mr. Justice Blackman, he was, it, although it's not in the record, the fact is he was called there as a witness in a case which he was not involved in himself. Uh, when he, while walking through that corridor, he was wearing a jacket upon which were inscribed the words, Fuck the Draft. Also were inscribed the words, Stop War and several peace symbols. When he entered the courtroom, he took off his jacket and held it folded. When he left the courtroom, he was ar arrested for disturbing the peace, specifically engaging in tumultuous and offensive conduct. Now, inside the courtroom, you say he took the jacket off, and uh, did he put it in a place where it was uh, prominently on view? No, Mr. Justice Stewart, he held it folded over his arm and it was not on view there. Furthermore, uh, the policeman who observed him walking through the corridor before he went into the courtroom, we, and this is in the record, requested the judge in the courtroom to hold the young man in contempt. The judge refused to hold the young man in contempt because there was nothing to be seen in the courtroom. There you go. Very fascinating and interesting oral argument. You saw there in the beginning the Chief Justice telling the lawyer for Mr. Cohen we, we're familiar with the facts. You don't need to talk about them. Obviously, not wanting him to utter those words in the court because they're offensive and the Supreme Court didn't, you know, Chief Justice was very conservative. This is late 1960s, of course, didn't want to hear that word in the court and was trying to sort of corral the lawyer into not saying it. Good practice pointer tip here on advocacy. If you want to check out our advocacy programs, we have a lot of them. This is very important. Um, advocacy example because the lawyer didn't bite and ultimately as you saw he uttered the phrase because he had to be comfortable recognizing that I'm arguing he has the right Cohen has the right to wear that on his jacket I can't act like there's something inappropriate about the phrase such that I couldn't even utter it in the court that sort of starts lending credence to the idea that the speech is so vulgar so profane that somehow it could be um, limited so that's a fun little um, oral argument sidebar on that and ultimately what the Supreme Court held is that the conviction of Cohen for um, you know, conveying that message was a content and viewpoint-based restriction on speech. And of course, content-based and viewpoint-based restrictions on speech are um, 
you know, near verboten, um, should not be done by the government. And here the message conveyed didn't fit into any of the recognized exceptions to the First Amendment. In other words, it wasn't Brandenburg incitement um, at play. And ultimately, and you have it there in bold, there's no compelling reason for California to criminalize this particular word as opposed to any other potentially offensive words. So Cohen and you are allowed to wear such a jacket into court. Now there are limits in FCC versus Pacifica. I just have it noted there from 1978 um, in terms of the government's ability to regulate profane language. This is the Supreme Court case that ultimately upheld the FCC regulations that um, forbid indecent speech from being aired on public radio waves during hours where kids could be listening. And so you can have those time-based um, restrictions of where the government does actually you know, quarantine offensive speech, so to speak. Um, during certain hours if kids are going to be listening and that would be okay. Which brings us to his jacket. What ultimately happened? Well, here's what happened. His convictions reversed. It gets sent back and it kind of trickles back eventually to the state trial court, Superior Court judge in California who had the case. And Mr. Cohen asked the judge for the jacket back because when he got convicted, the jacket was evidence and the judge had it. And what apparently happened is the judge didn't give it back. And you have there a quote as a fun little interview you can go read. Um, with him, but he never got his jacket back. So if you have, if any of you are eBay sleuths or treasure hunters or, or the kind, that would be a cool piece of legal memorabilia if we could get our hands on the original F the Draft jacket, um, seminal First Amendment case. If you find the jacket, shoot me an email. I want to bid on it. This brings us from our speech section now to our press section. New York Times versus United States. 403 U.S. 17, 1971, and this is the case of the press release of government Vietnam War documents. And so basically, it's the Pentagon Papers case. And what happened here ultimately is that um, Washington Post, New York Times got a hold of this Defense Department study um, of U.S. activities in Vietnam. It was an internal study that the Defense Department had commissioned. Um, it got secretly released um, you know, by Daniel Ellsberg. It's about 7,000 pages of classified documents about the war, the history of the war. And the newspapers got him, looked at him, and said, we're going to publish articles about him. And the Nixon administration went to court saying that you have to prohibit publication. It's necessary to protect national security and demanding an outright prior restraint. It goes up to the Supreme Court, which absolutely um, um, slams the Nixon administration and said any system of prior restraints on ex of expression comes to the court bearing a heavy presumption against its constitutional validity. And so basically the prior restraint order was denied. The request for a prior restraint order was denied. And ultimately there was no evidence that the safety of American forces was actually imperiled by this publication. And so the court refused to allow prior restraint against the press. Very significant case, of course, which has cast a long shadow into the 21st century as we've dealt with in, in the post-Iraq Afghanistan um, wars, a whole bunch of um, releases of um, classified documents by the press now in our digital virtual age over the internet and the like. But there's our press case from the Vietnam War that lives to this day. And that's going to take us to the religion clauses. And this is Clay versus United States, 403 U.S. 698, 1971. And it's the case of the right of a person to ultimately conscientiously um, object to a draft um, to go to war on religious grounds. And the case, is titled, the, the case is titled Clay versus United States because as the case started, um, it was um, a case against heavyweight boxing, um, you know, superstar legend Cassius Clay, um, who um, got a five-year sentence and a $10,000 fine for um, refusing to participate in the draft. Of course, Clay later changed his name to um, Muhammad Ali, as we all know him um, in, the 20, in, the, you know, in the 20th and 21st century, um, as the greatest, greatest boxer of all time. Now, um, as you see our facts here, basically what happened is um, Clay, later known as Muhammad Ali, uh, and I will call him Muhammad Ali because it's easier for us to sort of, that's how we know him, applied for a conscientious objector status and this was granted by an examiner, but the Department of Justice reversed and did not give him the status. So they said, you gotta show up for the draft. He refused to attend this draft induction event where you're supposed to show up at this time, this date, in this hangar, whatever, to be um, inducted. He refused to go, he gets arrested, he gets convicted, gets, an, gets a five-year sentence. Makes its way up to the Supreme Court. And the operating rule of law is that um, Muhammad Ali had to show that his, he is conscientiously opposed to war in any form. 
He must show that this opposition is based upon religious training and belief, as that term has been construed in our decisions. And he must show that this objection is sincere. And so that's the test for your First Amendment freedom of religion, free expression, that allows you, if you're within those four corners of that test, to say, I reject, I'm going to do the war and being drafted. And what the court found is that a hearing officer, it was a retired judge with a lot of experience, they heard the testimony from Muhammad Ali, his mom, his dad, um, one of his attorneys, a minister of his religion, and from him himself, of course. Um, you know, there's a full report from the FBI on top of that. And ultimately, the hearing officer found the religious beliefs were sincere. And so let's take a look at the government arguments here on our next slide. Um, of the Muhammad Ali case before the U.S. Supreme Court in this latest um, Vietnam case that lets us explore the First Amendment. So check this out. The our government's argument sustained by the court is that it is not enough that the objection be religious, but it must also be an objection to participation in war in any form. And uh, without that, the court's discussion of the establishment and the free exercises clauses of the First Amendment, in its opinion, a very uh, constructive and uh, helpful discussion would have been uh, wholly uh, unnecessary because it is, that is relevant only if the objections are clearly religious, and so they were, and so we concede here that the objections are religious. But the distinction between just and unjust wars though surely having a religious basis in Negri's mind, injected political and philosophical considerations into the picture. And it was with respect to this aspect of the matter that the government contended in its brief that Negri's position involved a judgment that is, quote, political and particular, close quote, that was one, quote, based on the same political, sociological, and economic factors that the government necessarily considered, close quote, in deciding to undertake the war. And those passages from the government's brief are quoted by the court in its opinion. And similarly here, we do not contend that the petitioner's claim is not religious, and we never have contended that his claim is not religious. The, claim, the contention that it is political and racial is not necessarily a contention that it is not religious. It is a contention which is entirely consistent with its being religious. If a man sincerely believes that he can participate in, in uh, racial wars or in just wars, he is not a person who is opposed to participation in war in any form. There is in this record a basis in fact for the conclusion that the petitioner's objection, though religious, is selective. Now that is that he is not opposed to participation in war in any form as the statute requires, but that he is in fact opposed to fighting what he regards as the white man's wars, although having no religious or conscientious scruples against participation in war which would defend the black man's interest. Well, there you have it. Fascinating little um, bit of oral argument about um, the religious beliefs and sincerity of them. And what the Supreme Court ultimately held unanimously is that there's no dispute that his professed um, beliefs were founded on basic tenets of the Muslim religion as he, as he understood them. And they derived in substantial part from his devotion to Allah as the supreme being. And so ultimately what the Supreme Court held unanimously is that he really did show that he was conscientiously opposed to the war based upon his religious training, um, this war, and that it was a sincere one. And so the government's counter arguments to try to say that he was okay with war in certain contexts, sort of that would maybe okay within, the, within the, the doctrine of the religion, wasn't enough to um, convince the court or anyone on the court that... Um, his First Amendment rights were not violated. So ultimately you saw his First Amendment rights were violated, the conviction's inappropriate, and that's an example of a conscientious objector case coming out of the Vietnam War. So let's now go from those seminal um, cases and take a look at what's the overhang as we work our way into the 21st century. And you know, a lot of those cases involved, um, or some of them, the Tinker case especially, involved 
um, student speech and concepts about student speech and the ability to limit them, um, the state's obligation to provide schooling and maintain some level of decorum in the school and all that, those competing interests, right? And this is gonna bring us to look at some cases of school codes and speech. Um, and so this brings us to, as you see on our slide here, Doe versus Michigan, 721 F's up 852 from 1989. And basically, um, State School, University of Michigan, has a policy on discrimination and harassment. Um, and its policy basically, um, you know, because they were seeing a lot of racial intolerance and harassment on campus in the 1980s, they adopted this policy that basically, um, you know, allowed or confronted a fact pattern, at least, of people who were, um, you know, issuing flyers that were inappropriate, like saying open season on blacks, um, this kind of like hate speech type stuff um, with, you know, horrible racial sort of strident commentary. There was a disc jockey on the radio campus that was making racist jokes. Um, there was even a KKK uniform displayed from a dormitory window. So these terrible sort of hate speech type things going on uh, caused this policy to be adopted that prohibited um, individuals from stigmatizing or victimizing individuals or groups on the basis of race, race, ethnicity, religion, sex, sexual orientation, national origin, etc. Um, and if students did it, then they could be punished. This case then makes its way to the district courts on a challenge under the First Amendment. And what the district court held is that credible threats of violence, Brandenburg incitement, of course, or threatening someone, like fighting words, libel, of course, defamatory speech outside the First Amendment. So there are certain categories that are outside the First Amendment and may be prescribed by government action. But what the university could not do, however, was establish an anti-discrimination policy which had the effect of prohibiting certain speech because it disagreed with ideas or messages sought to be conveyed. Nor could the university prescribe speech simply because it was found to be offensive, even gravely so, by large numbers of people. That, of course, ties right back to the rationale of the very important Tinker armband case about the importance of being subjected to offensive things as part of our First Amendment calculus. On our next slide, you'll see the UMW versus Board of Regents of the University of Wisconsin at 774 FSUP 1163. And this is a 1991 case. And here we had a case where um, some Doe plaintiffs file a lawsuit seeking an injunction against the University of Wisconsin's hate speech code. And the University of Wisconsin had this code it had adopted that basically provided that students could be disciplined for racist or discriminatory comments, epithets, or other expressive behavior directed at an individual. What did the district court hold? The problems of bigotry and discrimination sought to be addressed here are real and truly corrosive of the educational environment. In other words, the hate speech is damaging, it's terrible, we don't like it. But freedom of speech is almost absolute in our land. And the only restriction the fighting words doctrine can abide is that based on the fear of violent reaction, content-based prohibitions such as that in the rule, however well-intended, simply cannot survive the screening which our constitution demands. And so you see there again, this idea of the incitement fighting words type doctrine is so limited to sort of like provoking an imminent attack or something, um, as opposed to, you know, nasty, disgusting hate speech, um, that the, you know, ultimately leads to the conclusion that, that content-based prohibitions outside the fighting words type of context are not going to be okay within the, the Constitution of the First Amendment. And again, it goes back to our Vietnam War cases. And so that hate speech code was also struck down. Now, this is gonna bring us to, I thought I'd bring us up into the, you know, the 2020s to the most recent US Supreme Court case dealing with sort of regulation of student speech because we can now take it from Vietnam to hate speech to a 2021 decision, which is really important because it's dealing with um, regulation of student speech on campus, where we are now in another era of intense, obviously, um, you know, since the mid, you know, 2016, 2018 or so, since, since then into the, well into the 2020s, we're in another era of a lot of sort of social rancor, social protests, um, a lot of, um, you, know, you know, hate speech issues being litigated, um, a lot like the Vietnam War. Um, in terms of the social um, angst that it's, provo that, that it's provoked and sort of social controversy that funnels its way into the legal system and lets us intersect it with our First Amendment.
And this is Mahoney School District versus BL, um, 2021. And this case is fascinating because it collides with the modern technology world we live in, social media. What's the situation? Um, sophomore girl, she makes social media posts of herself. She's off campus and she you know, puts up her middle finger and she captions the photo, fuck school. Um, and that's something that she posts like on her Snapchat or Instagram page. I can't remember which social media one, sorry, but it's one of these social media sites. Um, the school then, <clears throat> you know, somehow this makes its way back to the school and they dismiss, dismissed her from the cheerleading varsity team she was on. And they told her that, you know, the following year you're going to be a JV. So she goes to court saying that you're, you know, infringing upon my first amendment rights and the lower courts and that you cannot do this. I get to stay on the varsity team and I get, you know, you know, dismissal shouldn't be done. District court grants a TRO saying, telling the district, you can't punish her based on the first amendment. You got to put her back on the cheerleading team. The case makes its way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court, echoing back to our Vietnam War cases that are so important on free speech um, that came out of the 1960s, says that schools can regulate student speech in certain contexts, indecent, lewd, or vulgar speech on site, speech promoting illicit drug use during a class trip, for example, materially disrupts classwork or involves substantial disorder or invasion of the rights of others, those types of inv invasive speech, and speech that others may reasonably perceive as bearing the imprimatur of the school. So those narrow areas, the schools are gonna have the right to have some say in regulating student speech. But the Supreme Court held. Off campus, the school has much less of an interest. And this was off campus speech, even if it sort of was related to school. Um, and her speech didn't ultimately cause disruption to any school interests. And so the First Amendment denied the right to punish her speech. And so I guess what you can conclude from this is F the draft and F school are protected phrases from the 1960s to the 2020s. So if you, if you want to say something, I guess, in a government building, the safest thing to say and know that you're within the First Amendment appears to, to involve the F word. Let's take now a look at the Brandenburg test, this incitement test in the 21st century, which is going to bring us to the Trump rally case. And this is a fascinating case that lets us look at Brandenburg today. Um, you know, in another era, era, of course, of protests. And so we have these large anti-President Trump protests that were going on um, and the, at his 2016 rally when he was running for president. Um, and there were some Trump anti-Trump protesters who ended up getting roughed up at his rally. Trump said to the crowd, get him out of here. And they ultimately then sued, um, I guess, either President Trump or this lawsuit was um, pre-President Trump, but they ultimately sued um, Trump for inciting a riot. Um, and causing them to get beaten up. The district court said that there was a plausible claim that candidate Trump had incited this little riot of sorts and so rejected Trump's free speech claim. In other words, the district court said Trump's speech was incitement speech within Brandenburg and so it was prescribable and so he could face liability for it. This went up to the Sixth Circuit and the Sixth Circuit looked at Brandenburg and said, no, 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 the Sixth Circuit reversed. Trump didn't specifically advocate imminent lawless action. And this is where the Brandenburg incitement test is so important. The words were said at a campaign rally by the main speaker in response to disturbances caused by protesters. The words were self-evidently said in order to quell the disturbances by removing the protesters. The words were directed to unidentified listeners in the convention center, among most, um, most of whom were Trump supporters who were not sympathetic with the protesters. In the ear of some supporters, his words may have had a tendency to elicit a physical response, um, you know, if someone refused to leave, but they didn't specifically advocate that response. And so that's what's so important. You have to be specifically advocating this sort of imminent lawless or riotous or violent behavior, not just say something that someone could, by a chain of log logic, interpret in a way. And so that's an important case showing um, the real limits of Brandenburg in terms of it being narrowly confined. Um, and so those people who got beaten up at the Trump rally were not able to sue Trump um, for damages. This brings us to our final segment. Was the Vietnam War legal? And I'm going to take a quick look at the, lit the litigation landscape. Remember Justice Douglas's dissent in O'Brien raised that issue. I teased you with it. Now we're going to talk about it. Um, and he raised the issue of, you know, is the Vietnam War even legal? And he wanted the Supreme Court to take it up. And so the underlying legal issue that he was getting at is that the war and the conscription, especially the draft, um, was it legal where Congress had never actually formally declared war? And of course, under Article 1, Section 8, Congress has the power to declare war. 
So let's take a look at Mora versus McNamara, 387 F second 862, DC Circuit 1967. And yes, that is Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense running the Vietnam War in the executive branch. Plaintiffs get drafted, they sue and they say the war is illegal, so we can't be drafted. Um, they squarely tee up the issue to reject their draft. Unlike Mr. O'Brien burning the draft card, they said we're going to court. Um, what happens in the district court? District court says the underlying questions whether the courts have any power to enjoin the president or others against um, you know, carrying on the war or hostilities um, of the war and the courts of the opinion that this is a political question outside the judicial function. And so basically, who gets to engage in war? Is it a right war, not a right war? These are political questions and the Article Three courts can't wade into this. And so this then was affirmed by the circuit court. Now this is taken up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court denies review, but two of our justices, Stewart and Douglas dissent, on, and their dissent raises the question of, was the Vietnam military activity a war within the Constitution requiring Congress to declare it? If so, and Congress didn't do it, it follows a draft, wouldn't be okay. Can the executive order people to participate in a military activity when no war has been declared by Congress? Those were the issues they raised that they wanted to address, but the rest of the court wasn't interested because she wanted to leave it as a political question for the political branches to sort themselves out as we do by voting and protesting and the like. This brings us to our next case, U.S. v. Hart, on our next slide, 382nd, F2nd, 1020. This comes out of the Third Circuit, also in 1967. And this one was similar. Um, defendant gets convicted for failing to report for a draft. So um, unlike an affirmative lawsuit saying the draft's unconstitutional, this guy actually got criminally convicted. He argued the government lacked authority to conscript in peacetime. And the activities going on in Vietnam had no declaration of war. Um, the government argued against this, of course, and said that conscription or a draft is not limited just to a congressionally declared war. Um, so what he was ultimately arguing was irrelevant. Um, the district court rejected the defendant's arguments against his convictions, and the Third Circuit affirmed his conviction. Again, it goes up to the Supreme Court, and again, the Supreme Court refuses to review, but again, Douglas, Justice Douglas now dissents. And this is important. It's clear from our decisions that conscription is constitutionally permissible when there has been a declaration of war, but we have never decided whether they may or be con whether there may be conscription in absence of a declaration of a war. Our cases suggest, but do not decide that there may not be. And so, what Justice Douglas was pushing was, look, we've never squarely addressed this. This is actually a legal question, not a political question. We have to interpret the Constitution, the, the War Powers Clause, and decide it. But the court didn't agree with Justice Douglas again, and so that 1968 decision didn't lead to a resolution. Holtzman versus Schlesinger is our um, next case here, final case, um, 361 FSEP 553, you see the citations there. And this is a case where we have, and this is 1973, so we're now getting towards the end of the Vietnam War, but basically we have a situation where some congressmen and Air Force officers filed a lawsuit. They wanted an injunction to stop the bombing in Cambodia. And they said, look, Congress has not authorized this, this massive bombing campaign in Cambodia. Um, you need to enjoin it because it's illegal. And the district court, Judge Judd, held that the bombing was illegal, absent congressional authorization, and actually enjoined the president. Um, he found that the appropriations bill did show support for the war, you know, appropriations bills being done by Congress, but they were not an open-ended approval of all military operations. And so even saying that Congress has approved the war through appropriations bills didn't give them this sort of free, uh, unlimited free check, in other words. Now, this goes up to the Second Circuit. It's a big deal. You've got literally a district court judge in the United States enjoining um, a, a bombing campaign being carried, on by, carried out by the executive. The Second Circuit reversed and said that these questions of military diplomatic expertise are not within Article III courts. It's political and it's for the political branches. And so these questions ultimately have to belong there. So the injunction was reversed. Again, went up to the Supreme Court. And again, the Supreme Court didn't take it, but we have a little bit of a battle in the, um, the, the denial of um, certain the decisions that were written by um, Mar Justices Marshall and Douglas in terms of how they were seeing um, that situation.
So, what are the lessons as we end here on the Vietnam War as it collides with our legal system? We saw speech and war. Burning draft cards is not okay because the government has an interest in those draft cards not being destroyed. Interestingly today, I don't know if that decision would hold given the other decisions and given the lack of a need perhaps for a physical draft card in this digital age. Maybe we can burn our draft cards if we ever get drafted. But armbands and anti-war messages that don't cause true school problems or disturbances cannot be limited. Um, and F the draft was not vulgar or lewd as used. F the school, still not lewd or vulgar. Press and war, we saw the absolute prior restraint um, being just a, a you know verboten within the First Amendment and being a no-no. Religious beliefs can justify refusing to fight the war for Muhammad Ali. In the shadow today, we looked at the school codes in terms of what it casts really today for our massive student protests that have been going on in campuses and in the streets in certain areas about wars, um, about political activities and, or politicians in society. Um, and we saw these codes that um, can, school codes that punish racist speech ultimately are con content-based restrictions that are improper, really creating limits in terms of the ability for schools to regulate um, hate speech. And ultimately, was the war legal? We don't have an answer. Um, the Supreme Court kept ducking it and justices kept pounding on the table, begging them to take it, but they never did it. And so perhaps it waits for another war, God forbid it never happens, for us to figure out if a draft can be done without congressional um, authorization. Thank you for watching this Curious Lawyer program. As always, if you have questions, please email me. Thank you.